Today's video is kindly sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. Have you ever had one of those days where it seems like the whole world is plotting against you? Your alarm fails to, well, alarm you. Your mustache refuses to be tamed. Your train's delayed and you arrive at work late, flustered and disheveled, only to find your boss has decided to channel Gordon Ramsay for the day. That feeling of complete helplessness when things fall apart is fairly common. We've all experienced it from time to time, even when, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, we weren't entirely blameless. It's so common, in fact, that psychologists have a term for it, self-serving bias. As we know, Raid Shadow Legends has a whole world of amazing looking champions, all from their own unique faction. And those factions have a lot of lore. Here's a quick dive into the first faction you meet, the Banner Lords. Remember, you can use my links below to download Raid yourself to your mobile, phone, or PC. So, the Banner Lords are basically medieval knights with a massive kingdom in the west of Talaria. They're arrogant and warlike, and believe themselves to be on the side of good. The lands of the Banner Lords were taken from the non-humans by force. Now, with the Banner Lords weakened by wars of their king, the time may be at hand for these races to right an ancient wrong by whatever means necessary. But it won't be easy, not with the Banner Lords having some amazing champions on their side, such as Baron and Lord Champford. I've been playing Raid for a while now, and my favourite thing is the campaign mode. With constant quest updates and a huge variety of locations, there's always a new and exciting challenge just around the corner. So, what's new in Raid this month? First up, they've released 11 amazing new champions. They've also released almost 200 brand new missions to complete, with an exclusive legendary champion as your reward if you manage to finish them all. So, what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on my links, and support my channel by downloading Raid today. Once you're in, you can find me in-game under the name 42. And if you're fast, you can even join my clan. Good luck, and I'll see you in-game. Thanks to our self-serving biases, we have a tendency to blame our failures on external factors like inconvenient weather or sod's law whilst attributing good outcomes to internal factors, such as our unparalleled ambition, innate brilliance, or disarming charm. When it comes to judging the behaviour of other people, however, we tend to be a little more, well, judgy. We underestimate the influence of external factors and overestimate the importance of internal motives and dispositions. Psychologists have a snazzy term for this too, fundamental attribution error. But if we aren't too careful, a combination of these two phenomena can create a perceived division between good people like us, who only do bad things because of external factors, and bad people like them, who do bad things because they're inherently flawed. One person who set out to demonstrate that this is rarely the case, and that any of us can do bad things if placed in the right situation, is psychology professor Philip Zimbardo. To do that, he conducted what has since become viewed as one of the most infamous and controversial social psychology experiments in history. The results of which might just make you question what kind of horrors you might be capable of, given the right set of circumstances. On the morning of the 15th of August 1971, a police car worked its way through the streets of Stanford, California, picking up college students as part of a mass arrest. Each student was charged, read his rights, spread eagled across the police car, searched, and promptly driven to the local station. After they were formally booked, they were each blindfolded and taken to the basement of the psychology department at Stanford University. Not that anyone familiar with this particular basement would have recognised it at this point, because it had been given one hell of a makeover. The main corridor had been boarded up at each end, and the labs had been transformed into sparse cells. The corridor had no windows, and all of the clocks had been removed 
making it impossible for anyone inside to judge the time. The reason for all these odd renovations was simple. Zimbardo and his team of researchers had transformed the basement into a fully functional prison. Surprisingly, this wasn't some kind of extreme hazing ritual. It was the setup for an ambitious social experiment to study the psychological effects of prison life. The recently arrested students had volunteered to take part and all of them had undergone a series of interviews and tests to ensure they were intelligent and of sound mind without any psychological problems, medical disabilities, or criminal records. Despite the drama of their arrests, it's hard to imagine the young men were particularly nervous about what lay ahead of them during the experiment. This was Stanford University, after all, one of the top academic institutions in the world. What could possibly go wrong? Well, they were about to find out. It's safe to assume the first few butterflies began to make themselves known in the students' bellies pretty much as soon as they arrived in prison. Each of them was stripped naked, disinfected, deloused, and made to wear a dress-like prison schmuck labelled only with a prison ID number. A heavy, bolted chain was placed on each of the participants' right ankles, and a nylon stocking was used to cover their hair. From that point on, they were only allowed to address their fellow prisoners and refer to themselves by their prison numbers. All of this might seem a little extreme for a university-approved psychology experiment, but the setup was carefully orchestrated to recreate the feelings of humiliation, emasculation, and anonymity often described by people who've been in actual prisons. After all, if the experience didn't feel real, the results would have been worthless. Once settled in, the prisoners were finally introduced to their guards, who were in fact nine other students who'd volunteered for the same study. The guards all wore the same khaki uniform, complete with a club, whistle and sunglasses to promote a sense of anonymity and ensure the prisoners respected their authority. Their instructions were simple. They were to do whatever they thought was necessary to maintain order and command respect within the prison. To say the prison guards embraced their roles would be an understatement. On that first night, they woke their prisoners up at ungodly hours for several counts. You know, just to make sure there hadn't been any escapes and anyone who refused to participate was punished with mandatory push-ups. Understandably, the prisoners woke up the following morning feeling a tad grumpy, and they quickly staged a rebellion, removing their stocking caps, tearing off their prison ID numbers, and barricading themselves inside their cells. Now, so far you may be thinking this all sounds like a bunch of students messing around and getting into character. And perhaps that was the case to begin with, but at some point, relatively early on, something changed. And the lines between the reality of the experiment and the fiction of the prison began to blur. When that happened, what had started out as an interesting social experiment rapidly spun out of control. That first morning, the guards crushed the fledgling rebellion by spraying the prisoners with fire extinguishers and bursting into their cells. The prisoners were physically subdued and split into two groups, the teacher's pets, who'd been the least involved in the rebellion, and the ringleaders, who'd led them into battle. The guards removed the ringleaders' beds from their cells, stripped them butt naked, and placed them in solitary confinement, where their food and access to basic human needs, like a functioning toilet, was limited. Meanwhile, the class favourites were placed in a different cell and given a bunch of privileges, including toiletries and access to better food, though they were only allowed to eat if they did so in front of the other prisoners. 
As you can imagine, these tactics caused resentment between the prisoners and broke any feelings of solidarity. And the guards fanned the flames of that conflict by swapping the two groups around for no apparent reason. As tensions continued to rise, one of the prisoners, number 8612, began to show signs of trauma, alternating between fits of uncontrollable crying and bouts of rage. If the experiment had already dipped its toes into an ethical grey area by this point, this is where it dove in head first. Instead of getting the distressed participant the hell out of there, as you might expect from responsible researchers conducting a social psychology experiment, Zimbardo and his team had become so used to thinking like prison authorities, they assumed prisoner 8612 was attempting to fool them. So instead of releasing him, the team chastised him for being weak and attempted to bribe him into becoming an informant. Unsurprisingly, none of this went down particularly well with the possibly mentally disturbed prisoner 8612. When he was promptly sent back to his cell and his fellow inmates learned what had happened, they quickly concluded that they weren't allowed to leave the so-called experiment under any circumstances. They had become, in effect, genuine prisoners. Over the next few days, things descended into utter chaos. The guards became increasingly cruel and tyrannical, forcing the prisoners to clean out toilet bowls with their bare hands, increasing the number of push-ups during counts, and even escalating their abuses. Described afterwards as becoming increasingly pornographic, in the middle of the night when they thought they weren't being watched by the researchers, the prisoners, meanwhile, grew more submissive, disorientated, and dejected. Almost a week into the experiment, Stanford PhD student Christina Maslach paid the research team a visit and was appalled at the way the prisoners, the students, so far as she was concerned, were being treated. And it seemed her outrage finally brought the research team back to their senses and reality because six days after the experiment's begun, it was abandoned and all the students were released. Weirdly enough, it seems Christina Maslach wasn't too repulsed by what she'd stumbled upon in the basement of the Stanford University Psychology Department because she went on to marry Zimbardo the following year. There's nothing quite like the sustained mental and physical abuse of a group of students to bring two people together. Today, Almost exactly 50 years on, the Stanford Prison Experiment serves as a cautionary tale. An unsettling indication of what can happen to any of us if we underestimate the influence of social roles and external pressures on our own behaviour. Remember, all of the participants in the experiment were tested beforehand, and every single one of them was found to be well-adjusted and intelligent just like you. Zimbardo believed his experiment showed flaws in the way we view the causes of violent or antisocial behaviour. Traditional psychology attempts to trace it to early roots nestled within an individual's psyche. Things like unresolved infantile conflict or defective genes. But this doesn't account for the fact that violent outcomes can be generated by very different types of people, including those who, to all intents and purposes, appear completely normal. More than 40 years after the experiment took place, shocking photographs were released showing American soldiers carrying out horrific abuses of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison during the Iraq war. George Bush declared the war crimes had been the work of a few bad apples. But for Zimbardo, if society puts good apples into a bad barrel, the barrel rots them. To see society's violent individuals as nothing more than bad apples is to make a large-scale fundamental attribution error, where we underestimate the influence of external systems, whether that be professional bodies, schools or correctional facilities, on our ability to act cruelly. The Stanford Prison Experiment has attracted a lot of attention over the decades, 
as much for its controversial methods as for its unsettling conclusions. It's been the subject of numerous films and even inspired an episode of American Dad. But it's also been heavily criticised, not least because it has subsequently come to light that Zimbardo himself instructed the guards to ramp up the cruelty, which is probably why similar experiments since have never been able to quite replicate his results. The scientific rigour, or utter lack thereof, of the Stanford Prison Experiment has also been questioned. And the small sample of students wasn't diverse enough to have any real significance for society at large anyway. And that's not even touching on the very long list of ethical concerns, the fact that the experiment continued even after participants said they wanted to leave, and the real risk of the participants suffering long-term psychological harm as a result of their treatment. The fact that Zimbardo's famous experiment was a bit of a shambles and doesn't really hold up to modern scrutiny might sound reassuring at first, but it probably shouldn't. After all, whether the guards in the experiment were cajoled into carrying out their abuses or dreamt them up all by themselves, nobody is calling into question whether or not they actually inflicted them on their inmates. And if the real conclusion of the Stanford Prison Experiment is that normal people will do terrible things so long as someone with authority tells them to, Zimbardo in this case, that doesn't really sound any more encouraging to me. Thanks for watching.